Hey everyone, Clay here, producer. Tom and Christiana have a book coming out February 25th called The Future We Choose. You can pre-order a copy right now at wechoosethefuture.com so that when it comes out February 25th, you get it right away. They just recorded an audiobook. There's an ebook version and a hardcover, so whichever you prefer, you can get it right there at the website. So we've been taking a moment at the beginning of the episode to read a quote from a friend about the book. So here's one from our friend, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Two of the greatest environmental minds are back with a call to arms for the battle of our time, terminating the threat of air pollution and climate change. The future we choose is a stark reminder that everyone's health and well-being rests on our ability to act courageously and fight for our future. So that was a quote from Arnold Schwarzenegger, actor and former governor of California. Again, you can pre-order right now, wechoosethefuture.com. They have an audiobook, an ebook, and a hardcover. Okay, here's the show. Hello, and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. My name's Tom Rivet Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. Today, we dig into the issues around the insurance sector and how they're dealing with climate change. Plus, we speak to Oliver Berte, CEO of Allianz. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing very well. You know, I have a very special guest who is joining me right now. Who's that? Who's see that? See if you can who's guess who it is. No, no, I can't. Who, 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 who's it going to be? You know who it is. You can see me on the video. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Topping. Hi, oh, Paul. my God. Hello. So Nigel and I are here. Uh, we're spending the day today uh, together with Amazon talking about their commitment to climate and what's going to happen. Um, but of course, Nigel has just been appointed the... Is it the champion for high-level action or the high-level high champion? High-level champion. I mean, honestly, Tom, we have to get our titles right. So you know, High-level climate action champion. Even Thank better. You, even there better. Go. Yeah, Sounds good. <laughs> for the UNF Triple C COP26 UK presidency. There you go. I, I tell you, Nigel's never been particularly good at acronyms, but he's now just masterful. It's very impressive. So I think we have to explain what that means. Nigel, do you want to explain or should I explain? Yeah, maybe I'll explain it and then and you can mark me out of 10, given that, you, you know, you've... you've, you've <laughs> okay, that's, okay, that's very okay, appropriate. That sounds, that, He's that on the spot. Right, this is serious, Nigel. This don't get this wrong. <laughs> don't get this wrong. Well, the, what I, ex- <laughs> why I explain to people is, you know, in the Paris Agreement, which, um, you know, you led, Christiana, um, and many of us worked on, I was working with the business community then with Women Business and the Paris Agreement. Part of the reason I think that, we know it succeeded was that the so-called non-state actors, it's a rather clumsy UN phrase, but it means businesses, cities, investors, states and regions, faith groups, civil society. Everyone youth, who's not a national government. Everybody who's right. not a government. So the, the Paris Agreement created a role called the, the High Level Climate Action Champion um, uh, and asked that the president of each COP appoint someone for two years so that we overlap. So I'll be working with um, my good friend Gonzalo Munoz from Chile to help um, coordinate, cheer on, drive, cajole, maybe provoke a little bit. Um, all of those um, actors who have real power, political and economic, um, to drive ambition and action and therefore you know, work with the, the state actors, the governments, to really accelerate the action that we need to solve this crisis. How to do. Nigel, I'm getting a little bit concerned because you're sounding very UN-y. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> 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 that was that was accurate, but that was definitely explained as you know an, a, a UN uh, brain already. I'm very concerned if you're going to be you know taken into that. You, you know, one of the first things Christiana said to me when she offered me a job was, "If you learn a single UN acronym, I'll be very disappointed." <laughs> which I thought was a great statement. Also, I noticed later that that statement contains an acronym, which I also thought was yeah. very good. <laughs> well, okay, so so my job is to get all the businesses, investors, cities, and everybody in the world to um, get on with driving towards net zero by by 2050 and halving emissions in the next decade. Uh, oh, so much better. Go. I like that version. <laughs> Yay, and, much and, better. And using that to drive what I would call that ambition loop to change the politics so that, so that governments realize that everybody else is moving and that if they want yep. to be elected, if they want successful economies, um, if they want to be able to look yep. their children in the eye, then governments need to move as well. So that's the role. Fine. Okay. Awesome. Now you there got we go. it. Very good. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> Phew, I'm relieved. I think I feel up to about four out of ten first time, mate. What do I get second time? <laughs> 
So <laughs> ten I, I'm not, we're not going to ask you about the obvious question around who your boss is going to be in the government, because that seems a little unfair. Yeah. But um, once you are imposed and once everything gets put into place in terms of what's going to happen, we very much hope you'll come back and talk to us at more length around the year, how we can all help, what's needed from everybody listening, because it's a crucial role and we're thrilled you're holding yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Tom, hold on. I think I, I, I think actually we have to explain that because that was a little bit cryptic. Okay. So um, what that actually means, what Tom has said in somewhat of a cryptic fashion, um, <laughs> is that uh, Nigel um, does have his official role that will uh, be steady and uh, and I'm sure very productive, but that we know that the COP president who will preside over COP26 is currently under discussion. And so that's what um, Tom means about who your boss is going to be, because that would be um, the COP president of COP26, which is um, still under the discussion on the part of the British government. And we were together at the launch this week, Prime Minister and David Attenborough were there. And I mean, you know, obviously there's been lots of coverage about it, but there definitely seemed to be a strong signal of political ambition and momentum was my, what I took away from it. I, I, I mean, for me, I'm really encouraged, you know, and I'm starting to get to know the, the COP unit, which Claire put together and which will continue. And it's a very strong team, with very clear pl- plans. Um, I think we had very strong signals yesterday from the Prime Minister, in fact, both Prime Ministers, the Prime Minister of Italy as well, um, of their personal commitment, both domestically and and internationally. Um, so yeah, it was nice to have the, the the starting gun fired, and I'm or you know, I'm almost overwhelmed with the offers of help. That's my biggest challenge at the moment. Is so many people all around the world, every geography, every generation, every sector want to help make the COP a success. Want to help make the Paris Agreement success, and the. The one thing that I'm also noticing is that there's a lot of misunderstandings in the media about what will and won't happen in Glasgow. So I think we have a collective job to uh, make sure that people understand that the world is not negotiating a new deal in Glasgow. Yes, I, I'm so glad you say that, Nigel, because I actually did see yesterday in some of actually some of the most authoritative media in the UK um, the statement that Glasgow is going to negotiate a global agreement um, to curtail rising temperatures. I mean, hello. Let us um, let us really understand here that actually it is odd. It is odd, Nigel, that we have. COP26, which is traditionally all of these COPs, which are conference of the parties, meaning all those national governments that are um, that have ascribed themselves to the uh, climate convention. Um, it is rather odd that we have that in our head as a negotiation, whereas in reality, there is nothing to negotiate. This is all going to be unilateral uh, statements and commitments of national governments on the one side of what more they're going to do. And on the other side, which is Nigel's first responsibility, um, the the momentum coming from every single other sector. So um, it is odd to continue to call those things negotiations when actually mm. it is not a negotiation. What would you call it instead, Nigel? Do you have a, a different noun for it? Um I think it needs to become, and I think it is gradually becoming, a um, like an action accelerator. It's where people mm. come together from all the different stakeholder groups from all over the world and um, step up their own commitments, whether they're national governments or individuals or businesses or investors or cities, um, but also learn about just how fast it's possible to transform our economies. I mean, one of the things I've been really struck by is that in the 15 months since the IPCC 1.5 degree report, um, suddenly all sorts of actors are reorientating towards net zero by 2050 as the North Star, which wasn't the case 15 months ago. Yeah, People were really focusing on well below two degrees. And which is consistent with a maximum temperature rise of 1.5. That right. is really quite a radical shift from where we were, well, certainly before Paris, but after Paris, where we were basically uh, heading for below two degrees. But I think increasingly uh, everyone has done sort of a search and replace on those those two degrees and replaced it with 1.5 because we have realized anything that goes above 1.5 is just destructive beyond description. Yeah, and, and I, I think that that, that um, sort of search and replace function that you described, we see it in all sectors, right? We see it on the streets, we see it in yeah, boardrooms. It's it's very... not, not, not everybody, but it's a real, well, we've passed a real inflection point. And it's both a realization yep. of the urgency Agreed. of 
the message from well, the science. I was just going to, sorry, Nigel, to interrupt you. I was just going to say, um, I, I know you have many offers and many things that you are um, thinking about, but between two and three in the morning when you don't have anything else to think about, um, we will accompany you in this little exercise, which is to figure out what the better description of uh, of these sessions are, because ne yeah. negotiations is definitely not it. Um, I heard you say an action accelerator, which is also it, but it's not a very sexy name. So um, let's, <laughs> let's all of us commit to... Um, thinking of a, another name, another noun that is um, descriptive of what is really going on and that I think will help in communications, right? The more we continue yeah. to talk about the climate negotiations, the more we confuse people. So we have to think about something else. So you have our promise collectively, including Clay, uh, who's anyway up at two o'clock in the morning with his baby, <laughs> to, um, to think about a different way to describe that. Wonderful. Thank you. I look forward to that. Amazing. Nigel, thank you so much for making this cameo appearance. We look forward to having you on properly very soon. <laughs> okay, I look forward to that too. <laughs> See you later. Great to talk to you, Nigel. Bye, Nigel. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Cool. So um, that was lovely to have our friend Nigel join us there. But we, we have another issue that we want to cover off. And of course, um, you know, we want to make sure that this is succinct and focused. So last week, Christiana, or the week before when we were in Davos, we had the opportunity to speak to Oliver Beatty. But just before we go to his interview, he's such an interesting person. And Allianz is such an interesting organization because they sit at this intersection of, of insurance and all of the issues that they have to manage with increasing natural catastrophe risk, as well as being an asset owner. So they actually own huge amounts of capital that they hold on behalf of insurance policyholders and others. And they make decisions about how they're going to allocate that. And in both of these areas, they've been a real leader. I wonder, Paul, do you want to just kick us off? I mean, you've been a, a thinker about these issues for such a long time with CDP. How do you see the role of these types of very interesting organisations? I mean, there are two points about uh, uh, about insurance. Uh, you, you put them very well there. I mean, you know, what was it in his speech in uh, Davos? Uh, Trump called Greta a prophet of doom. But um, there's a company called Munich Reinsurance, and they insure insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So they're a reinsurer. And they, they produced a big book. I used to have it in my bathroom. It was a big hardback book. And on the cover, the title was simple and clear. It just said, Weather Catastrophes and Climate Change. Is there still hope for us? Right? And that book was published in 2005, 14 years ago. Right? Mm. So trust me, insurance companies understand climate change you know, in, in, with incredible depth. But what you say about them being an asset owner is very important. And um, I did once speak to an asset owner, now deceased, and, uh, uh, who, who uh, represented the pensioners for the California Public Employees Retirement System. And I remember I said to him once, what's your investment horizon? Is it 20 years or 40 years? And he said, in perpetuity, there is no end date for the state of California. So I particularly uh, remember that comment, that uh, asset owners think essentially uh, for the very long term. So an insurance company that is both thinking about climate change and thinking very long term, that's very exciting. Mm. Very exciting to talk to such a person. Well, in addition to the fact, I must say that um, Oliver and Gunther Tallinger, who is his um, second in command there, have been so visionary about the fact that Yes, they are risk gurus, as I call the insurance companies, and that in order to protect their assets that they own and to protect their clients on the insurance side, they actually have a very powerful tool on the other side of the industry, which is how to invest those assets. And so Oliver and, and Gunther um, have been particularly visionary on that. And as we will hear in, uh, in, the, in the interview, they are basically the ones who started this idea of an asset owner alliance that crosses geographies, but that really invites in large institutional investors to use what I would call, you know, the top of the financial food chain posi position that they have to mandate asset managers and to mandate the companies that they partially own to do what we've just talked about, that search and replace. Yeah. Forget the two degrees, we have to go to 1.5. So, you know, kudos, kudos to uh, to Allianz, to Oliver and to um, Gunther, who we did not um, interview. 
for, for people listening who maybe haven't kind of really considered, which is entirely understandable, sort of the role of some of these institutions that, whose incredibly powerful role in shaping the future of our society is sort of somewhat invisible to most people day to day. You know, insurance seems, you know, like a day to day thing that you buy, but its role in changing the world and their role as holding assets that can actually be deployed in a way that changes the world. I think this is a really interesting conversation. It's the new politics. I, I, I want to hear this interview. Let's, let's, let's roll it. Sounds good. Oliver, thank you very much for taking the time to come on our podcast, Outrage and Optimism. Um, and just, you know, for, for your background, the reason why we name it Outrage and Optimism is because we think that we need both outrage about what is not happening, as well as optimism about what is happening, and then come somewhere down in the middle. So um, so that's the, the reason for the title. And so I'm going to be very interested in the conversation that the three of us will be having today, where you come out on outrage and optimism. Hopefully you're fully loaded on both. Uh, but let's see. <laughs> let's see. Could we start, um, Oliver, with, uh, with insurance and risk? Because I have said very often publicly and privately that, at least from my perspective, the insurance industry are the global risk gurus of the world. So I would love to know first, when did you have your aha on the risk of climate change? When, when did you really sort of bite into it and realize that Allianz would have to do more than it had been doing in the past? Yeah, it's very interesting. I don't know exactly uh, the date. It was not sort of a New Year's revelation or something like that, but uh, it was around the year 2010 when I was uh, just become the chief financial officer of Allianz and a part of the remit is to be responsible for risk management. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at some very fundamental things. And most of what we were thinking in terms of insurance and climate risk were sort of in a diversified spreadsheet somewhere. And I remember looking at something that was not climate first and foremost. I will talk about it, not, and that's earthquake risk. And then people were telling me, you know what, we don't really look at the real outcomes. We look at what can happen in 250 years, what can happen in 200 years. But I said, yeah, but how much money can I lose if, in the, the, very diff <laughs> if, the, if the difficult thing happens? What is yeah. it that we are actually insuring? And we were looking at the country of Romania and say, people, will, it will never happen. It's theoretically possible, but it will never happen. But if it happens, we will lose like two billion. And I said, what is... How much can we lose? <laughs> One country. One small country. By the way, wow. the value of the company we run for us was about 200 million. So you could lose 10 times more than actually the value of the business. So I started to dig into this and says, why are we so easily um, or readily um, ignoring tail risk? And it's the human mind. That's actually why we as human mm -hmm. beings have been mm -hmm. super successful. We just ignore it, right? We hunt mm -hmm. things that are 10 times taller than we are. But... We tend to ignore things that look remote or far away. So as part Assuming of Assuming that it's just going to go away on its own. Yeah, it's never going to happen. And then some, the same guy told me, by the way, the financial crisis that we've just gone through is a one in a million year event. One in and a million years. And it just, year. just happened twice the last 10 years. Remember, 2001 and 2002 was the first form. So this is uh, so much for math. So we started to think through... What could really happen if we do not look at diversify uh, um, uh, numbers or look at what the model would tell you is a expected outcome, but more what can really happen and take the probabilities out? Because probability is something that makes us feel good. Mm. And then the number of the feel risks good. that came up had a lot to do with climate change. So surprise, surprise, people said, yeah, if we have warming, then the floods will be ever more frequent, they will be ever more severe, the storms will be ever more severe. So I was really questioning the way we were modeling our exposure and obviously pricing for it. So that, again, I think it happened sometime in spring in 2010. And then we really changed the way we're looking first in terms of defending ourselves, i.e. how do we think about buying reinsurance and protecting ourselves. And then in the second step, looking at the underlying drivers of risks, first with traditional ones like fires and floods, and then really thinking the matter through. And uh, rather sooner than later, the question then when, when we met much later, that climate change will have a profound impact on our industry and the losses that we would incur. And then that the industry did not have the proper uh, pricing mechanism for that. Now, the second thing was 
that in 2015, we started to have massive NETCAT events, particularly in the United States. Mm. And NETCAT industry, is natural catastrophes. Na, excuse me, yeah, yeah, natural catastrophes. And again, they were saying, yeah, we don't see really climate change in the statistics yet. Yeah, all these crazy sciences are forecasting global warming, but we don't really see it. And when you look at how they do the numbers, they take like the last 100 years averages. So recent trends get periodically suppressed. Mm. So we decided to change that. And then the rest is history. Spend a lot of our energy on saying we have to have a view and we have to have a voice, not just a view, because the industry is not properly assessing the risks. Mm. And as uh, some of the largest investors that we are, we cannot only look at it as insurers, we have to look at it as the world's largest institutional investors too, mm -hmm. because we're driving investment decisions. Well, we'll get to that piece in a minute, but can I just ask for one more clarifying piece when you said we changed that? Uh, so walk us through for us lay people, how does the um, insurance industry change that? Because obviously what you have is you have information of the past, you have statistics of the past, and with climate change, all of that is turned upside down because mm -hmm. whatever was the pattern of the past, you know for sure is not going to be the pattern of the future. But you still have all of that data. And in order to foretell, to foresee the risk that you're going to look at, you don't have any data, at least not from events that have occurred, what you have is science. So what do you do? Uh, very simply, uh, as you said, layman's term, mm -hmm. we always look to price a risk at two important factors. What is the severity of an event in terms of what losses does it create mm -hmm. and how much of these losses for human beings economically, and then the, the moral ones we obviously cannot assess, but how much of the economic losses are actually insured or insurable. And then the second driver of pricing is what is the return period? So how often can this happen? And you typically have errors in the science, both in terms of how severe can events be, that is by the way more easily uh, quantifiable, and then, then people start to cheat when it gets in terms of what are the return periods. Obviously, it makes a huge difference, difference whether something happens like the floods we had in eastern Germany every 20 years or every 200 years, which exactly. was the ass assumption, no? 10 times the premium difference. Mm. And then, and I'll say with all respect for the actuaries, he says, yeah, but if it's every 20 years, nobody's ever going to pay the price for it. So sometimes you have what I call the mental shutdown mechanisms. Mm. You know, if that was to happen, we couldn't insure these risks anymore. So let me, as, as long as I can, assume it's only every 200 years. Mm. So therefore, you need senior management to really go into both the, the modeling of the exposures and the return periods and then have a, a, a real academic debate and then a practical debate on, let's assume it's much more frequent than what we thought. How do we start addressing these risks? In our case, we actually came to the conclusion it's going to be much more likely and much more severe based on what climate change is doing to us. And, and then a lot what, of things much happen. More, how do, what is much more? Two times, three times? How, how Do you pull a number out of the hat? It depends on the event and the exposure. No, we don't pull a number out of a hat. But we start a model and then we come to a different conclusion and said, you know, what is an event that we don't want to be exposed to given the premium levels that we have in the market and where we need to talk to policymakers about changing? Because when a risk becomes uninsurable because the premiums exactly. get too high, you need policy action. Mm -hmm. So you need much more protection right. against floods. You need to make sure that people don't get permits to build houses in areas that can be flooded. So many things have to happen. Mm -hmm. Very inconvenient. <laughs> Very inconvenient, but they drive real change. Yeah. And c can I ask about a real world example? I mean, what we've just seen in Australia over the last few weeks and months has been catastrophic. We had Kevin Rudd on the podcast recently. What does that do to your analysis as you now look at Australia and think much of that loss must have been insured, potentially by Allianz? What does that do to your calculation in terms of what happens next? Yeah, it's not so much of that because otherwise investors would get very nervous. But the, the, yeah. to be fair, is not just the uh, fires have been devastating. And the first thing is to always think about the human and the, mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, the other tragedy is for wildlife. Just think about the billion probably animals, billion that, animals that, yeah. that have been killed. So that's already dreadful. But the key learning is when initially the fire started, it was in November in Sydney, people were telling, yeah, we have always have these bushfires. And by the way, it's not a lot of insured losses, not much is happening. So people 
tend to ignore these things right. and it's until it's too late. Too late. Until it's too late. And we certainly have learned there will be more losses than obviously historically experienced, by the way, much more than people can imagine. And therefore, we have to act. But mm. uh, to my surprise, and I don't mean it in a negative sense, I'm also surprised how little action was taken from the political responsible people that right. grew up, actually grew up in this environment have been sort of ignoring it. Yeah. Unfortunately, with climate change, as we've seen along, you know, when we met for COP21, it was business driving governments, not the other way around. It is that, again, you know, my, my, my sense is that um, leadership goes around in a cyclical pattern and that business had led before 2015, businesses had acted courageously enough that it gave enough confidence to governments to take a leadership and be able to agree the Paris Agreement. And now we're coming around the circle where businesses are definitely taking much more leadership. And hopefully we can close that circle with enough confidence given from the private sector and from um, and, and from industry that governments will be able to do what they need to do at the end of this year. So they, in the best of all cases, they feed constructively and positively on each other. Mm. But I would agree with you that the leadership right now is definitely in the private hands. Mm. And we really need policy changes. You, know, yes. you mentioned Australia. Um, we've had a number of provinces where there have been sort of market failures because there were um, not very well thought through policy measures in terms of how to manage risk. Mm -hmm. you know, when you, I get asked an, as an industry to provide capital for free, we know that markets fail. Yeah. Right? So you need to make sure that people understand there is a price for risk and if it diversifies, we can price it. If there's things that, you know, do not diversify, we need government solutions also. Mm. So let's talk about fine, about um, insurance instruments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go over to you uh, as, uh, as an institutional investor, um, we have been uh, quite impressed with the number of insurance companies that are pulling their uh, insurance instruments from underneath coal for sure. Um, and I think increasingly other fossil fuels because of the risk there. Um, talk to us about that. Is that, do you see a trend there? Where do you see that going? Do you see it having much effect on uh, companies such as coal companies? So for us, I can only speak of Allianz and because I know that the industry is moving forward, but other country, uh, companies are doing it differently. It actually came from the investment side we're going to go to. So mm. when we started to, and it was with um, Max Zimmer, our former chief investment officer, we, uh, the two of us went through when I became CEO and says, you know, if we really drive markets, you know, if Allianz is said to say, if we invest in something, then others buy. If we divest, others divest. We really have a leadership function. We need to really score our assets. And we developed with Transparency International, uh, Worldwide Fund for NATO, uh, German Watch, we developed an MSCI as a data provider. We developed a scoring mechanism for the sustainability of industries. No, surprise, surprise, coal didn't come out very well. I'm so surprised. Yeah, we, we were also very surprised. And then we said, okay, now that we need to do something. And it was a pretty lonely decision because everybody says, go do go uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll hide behind the tree yeah, and then exactly. see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we decided. And in Germany, as you can imagine, it was particularly uh, interesting because our government had decided to exit nuclear, which is one of, at least from a CO2 Relying perspective. Relying on coal. Yeah, right. So we are totally relying on coal and CO2 emissions uh, in, in Germany were skyrocketing right. against the promises, by the way. Right. Mm. Correct. So we said we will stop investing in new coal uh, burning platforms and we will run off our engagement with these companies over the next few years. So we don't want to divest overnight. We, we want to give them some time to... Uh, adjust a business model, which is, by the way, very important. We need to understand that we have an influence. We need to give organizations and industries time to adapt. Mm -hmm. Not too much, but also be a realistic. We need science-based yeah. targets, not just emotionally-based targets. So we mm. need to balance science with emotions, a little bit like the optimism with the... Yes, with, with the big, outrage. With the <laughs> outrage. And that's what we said. We have the dialogue. And if within a matter of 24 months we cannot come to agreement, we will divest. We will not announce that because we have a lead and we don't want to drive share prices of other people. But I can tell you the day after I got a lot of call from senior managers of the coal industry not being, being very, very happy. nervous. 
Now, the second stop was obviously people asking us and saying, well, if you're not investing in them, why the heck are you insuring them? Mm -hmm. And we said, well, as long as they operate uh, these factories for a number of years, the coal producing, they need to have insurance. And they said, yeah, but that's it cheap excuse, right? So we developed a strategy to also stop insuring first new ones. And then over time, we are also taking out systematically the existing ones. Again, giving them time, giving them time mm -hmm, to adapt. To transition. That's fascinating. I did not know that it had come out of the investment yes. mm -hmm. uh, transition. That is really fascinating. Well, can we move to that? Yeah. Because, um, Oliver, I really would like to give you public credit, if I may. Uh, and you're getting very nervous now, <laughs> as, a good, as a good German. <laughs> <laughs> For um, this fantastic alliance of asset owners that, of course, is under UN direction et cetera, et cetera. But I have my little suspicion that this idea came out of you. It came out of Allianz. I have to give a lot of, <laughs> a lot of credit to a number of people. We have, by the way, a colleague, Gunter Tallinger, my chief yes. investment officer, who is, you know, has his, his heart and passion in there. Totally. Yeah, but it was an idea that came as a reaction, actually, to criticism that is very warranted to say, well, it's nice that you are sort of having ESG products on the asset management side, that you are stopping to insure these things, that you have this scoring mechanism, but you don't have a target. Mm. So the real criticism was you don't have a target by which you really want to be out. And we looked at that and says, how the heck do we do this? Now, the second problem uh, we debated was, well, what is the right time scale, right? Germany wants to be out of coal now by... I'm making 2038? This, uh, 30, 30, how did we come about with 2030? By the way, there's no plan, right? There's just... 38, yeah. Yeah, there's an... So we looked at what we call the science-based target initiative that mm. comes from the UN. And there is a target to say we're going to go by 2050, we want to be zero. Yeah. Exactly. The whole world. The whole world. And says, you know, so rather than having alliance ethics and alliance standards mm. and alliance scoring, we will piggyback on what the UN is trying to do, which has been agreed with a lot of By people, everyone. everybody to do. We're going to use this and then we need to go. Now, the third complication was whatever we do, the way we run, we thought about, you know, reducing air travel and driving fewer cars, having green building. We knew that even by 2050, we would not be zero. Because we emanate, we will still, at least I will still eat a steak, maybe not every day anymore as I did as a juvenile, but maybe once a month. So there will be CO2 emissions. So what do we do? Net zero. Hmm. Net zero is really serious. We need to have so-called carbon sinks and we need to not say, okay, I'm buying a certificate, which already as a CEO with my first job in Allianz, I agreed with our CFO, we would actually build forests to create certificates ourselves, not go to the market and buy them, but really grow forests and then generate the certificates, okay. would use the same idea and say, we need to also be able to offset whatever the base load is by having developed carbon sinks ourselves. So that is what the ambition is today. And that is what we did. Then we had the idea, now we need a multiplier. So if Allianz goes first, everybody wants credit. And most of our competitors are saying, ah, here's another Oliver Beta Alliance idea. We will not get all the credit. So what do we do? So we asked the UN and says, could you please sponsor that so it doesn't become an Alliance idea, right. but it becomes really a UN-sponsored initiative. That's the story. And now everybody's working very hard. As you know, we started with 2.4 trillion. And I will not give you the actual number, but by the end of the week, it's going to be more than double. Wow. Yeah, so we're getting a lot of support. We had just had the Church of England join. We're looking both in terms of opinion leaders and people with lots of assets. People know institutions with lots of assets, right? They're all yes. institutional. Yes. They're so, all, in, yeah, asset, I, asset I forgot owners. to explain the most important thing. No, Allianz, we have a differentiation. Sorry, I, Oliver, can you, because not all our listeners will understand the difference yep. between an asset owner and an asset manager. Mm. And I think it would be really helpful for you to explain that to us so that we understand the repercussion consequence that an asset owner has over an asset manager. So yeah, I should have done that. Absolutely correct. So we, Allianz is um, both. We are investing about 700 billion euros on behalf of our policyholders, insurance clients and our shareholders, because the equity part is also included. 
where we have the ultimate responsibility for the asset allocation because we're doing it contractually on behalf of policyholders. Mm. They entrust us with their savings and we do make the investment decisions. So we are responsible for the asset allocation. Do we invest in this company or don't we? And policyholders is mums and dads on the Moms street. Mums and dads, yeah. everybody that buys car insurance from us for yeah. just a short-term part, investment Great. horizon about three years on average, but also life insurance clients that may have a pension with us and they're making the decision to entrust us with their money for 50 years and more. Exactly. So that puts you into a very different position and much more responsibility, and we call that asset owners, than asset managers. We're also one of the largest asset managers in the world through our subsidiaries, PIMCO and Allianz Global Investors. There it's different. There the asset owners, people like us, define a mandate for the asset management firms and say, we would like to invest, have you invest the following way. This is what you put excluding in Excluding the following. You could say excluding the following, mm -hmm. but many don't. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, and it's very important also for activists to understand, at asset managers, we have to follow the mandate of our clients. Exactly. Right. Actually, in the United States, it's a criminal offense not to follow the advice and the requirements of the asset owners, right? So we can recommend to them and says, here is an ESG compliant product. Here is actually a, a really thought through green product. But at the end of the day, the teachers fund of City XYZ in the United States can say, what we'll the hell? We'll give you instructions. I'll give you an instruction. This is how you're going to invest. So that's exactly. the key difference. Mm. The good news is as asset owners, we have no excuses. <laughs> so, yeah, so going you back can't to hide that, behind anyone. <laughs> we cannot behind anyone. And we said, okay, so why don't we start there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, We will do all that we can do in terms of advice. But the asset managers often also have very high ambitions, but their ability to really drive clients is limited by their mandates. Mm. As asset owners, we can really do that. So we, we brought other institutional investors, both from the insurance world, but also from the pension funds world that historically have been engaged, like Pension Denmark or the Canadian pension funds, into a room, CalPERS, and said, this is what we'd like to do. Would you support us? And we were really enthused by the support that we were getting. And are you seeing change in the behavior of asset managers in relation to that? Are you seeing them producing different products, the narrative sort of changing? Because what you're describing is a major change in strategy from a number of their most important clients. Yes, and they're obviously very clever marketeers. Yeah. And it says, we always wanted it, <laughs> of <right>. course. <laughs> like we also wanted long-term capitalism and sustainability, <laughs> and we're just not doing it, but I'm sorry. Um, yes, it is changing yeah. massively, but mm. it has to be driven by the end client and there's more upside because I know that Christiana is going to ask me who is not coming along quickly, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you in a sec. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Since you brought it up yourself. <laughs> no, the funny, the funny part is, you know, you would assume that the money that's actually run and owned by governments called sovereign wealth funds mm. would be the first to join. Mm -mm. Hmm. not coming. And you would say those that have actually the most difficult carbon footprint because they're actually living off of oil and would have a, a particular duty to do something. We just talked about Australia, coal, Middle East, Norway. The my Norwegians favorite, are there. My favorite country, yeah. making all its money on oil and gas. Japan being a big user of oil and fossil fuels, you would assume that their sovereign wealth funds would be the first to join. Mm -mm. So I'm hoping for some did, help did, to convince them. Did the Japanese way. not join? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. Not yet. And it's okay. not easy for them, I do understand, because yeah. then the second question comes, well, if your sovereign wealth fund can join, why is your public <laughs> policy not changing? So right. they're very inconvenient right. follow-on questions to think that through. But start somewhere. I've just spent a week in China last week, and people are very excited. You know that China is increasing CO2 emissions until 2030, given their economic development. And I saw a lot of asset owners last week, and many of them said, pretty please help us to work with our governments to find a way in how to do that, hmm. because that would already make a contribution. So I'm finding a lot more activism in a positive sense from the Chinese than I find in many sort of developed countries Isn't that in the interesting? West. What do you attribute that to? Well, I think they have a bad conscience. They have been living through pollution the last few years. They know that they have yeah. a responsibility uh, to do something. And they're very long-term thinking. Mm. 
A little bit of opportunism is maybe yeah. also involved. And is that you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons the sovereigns have been slow to get involved is because of the potential follow-on questions? Are there other reasons? Because it seems very strange that they're so late to the game. I'm a bit paranoid about them not joining, but I'm optimist enough. And if I'm not getting enough support this week, I'm going to get outraged. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, <laughs> fully loaded. <laughs> yeah. But that's what we need to achieve because I yeah. think once we have three or four of the big relevant sovereign wealth funds, I think a lot of the rest further will come. Yeah. momentum will build. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Can I just ask you one more question before we let you sure. go, which is um, the, the biggest news so far in 2020 from a finance perspective on climate change has been Larry Fink's letter. And I'm very curious to know what that letter looks like from the perspective of an asset owner. Thank you, Larry. We've been telling you for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you're late very to the good. party. No, I, I think it's you're late to the party, but welcome to the party. <laughs> welcome all the same. <laughs> He's a good friend. He will forgive me. Well, um, <laughs> how much of a difference will it make? I think a lot. Yeah. Actually, it doesn't matter when people join the party. The most important thing is they join the party right. and we single out those that don't mm. and talk to them. Which is the task this week. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. What what a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for, for taking the time, but more than anything, thank you for, for taking such a courageous leadership uh, with your company and with the industry and with pushing all the rest who are yet to join the party. Let's, uh, let's be ready to welcome them to the party. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you, you so for much. having me. It's a true honor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Oh, did we ask you where you are between optimism and outrage? And on both sides, depending on the time of the day and depending on the day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to go answer. on overload on both at the same time, actually. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So that was amazing to have that conversation with Oliver Betty. I mean, I think that we all felt after that, that that was just one of the most insightful conversations that we've been privileged to have so far on Outrage and Optimism in terms of where it signals where we need to go and the levers we can pull. And my goodness, he's really been bold and stepped out in front. What do you guys leave that with? What were the sort of main, main highlights for you? I mean, uh, I, I thought he was so funny that he talked about the fact, he was talking about human nature, human behaviour. He says, was it we hunt things 10 times our size? We just ignore it. That's why we're so successful. I was falling about <laughs> with laughter. He called it the mental shutdown method, um, which is a big part of, of, of human success. Um, but he appreciates denial as part of consciousness. And I thought it was very interesting to hear him mention that. Well, um, I, I thought because we started also this podcast, um, you know, thinking about this year and the lead up to COP26, um, I, I really think that uh, initiatives such as this one, the Alliance of Asset Owners, plus other initiatives that are continuing to grow in their momentum and in their impact in the financial world, are going to make a heap of difference this year. I would say that the finance uh, as a sector has sort of been tiptoeing its way into climate change management and uh, and 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 risk reduction over maybe eight years or so. Certainly they started before Paris. But I think this is the year in which that sector uh, is really going to be the sector that makes the biggest difference. And that's actually quite exciting mm. because, um, you know, the, it, it is a very simple tru truism that only that which gets financed gets built. And so, yeah. <laughs> and, and so when we're concerned about the building out, for example, more coal uh, infrastructure or more coal mining, which would be the absolute catastrophe to climate, just to give one example, well, if the finance sector are the ones who say, well, you know, could have been a good idea 10 years ago, but now we're not going to allocate capital. That actually can make the biggest difference in what gets built uh, and and therefore what is emitted 
over, uh, certainly over the next few years, but over this decade, which is the decisive decade. So, I mean, I, I, I thought everything about him was impressive in terms of the way he's been able to sort of lead this company in this new way and lead his entire sector, right? I thought it was interesting. And it's sort of, again, it's something we don't think about on a day-to-day basis, but this incredible lever that the sovereigns have to actually make an enormous amount of change. And this um, sort of almost schizophrenic response that governments are having of pushing for climate action on the one side and then the sovereign wealth fund not following Oliver's lead and actually deploying capital in a way that's consistent with that future was a really interesting thing to kind of uncover there. And I really think that's an area we have to make progress on this year. Just one other comment, which actually is something which happened this week, is um, Jim Cramer, who runs Mad Money, Uh, which is one of the most popular um, financial programs in the US, uh, who is purely there to pick stocks and turn a profit, came out comprehensively against fossil fuels. His exact quote was actually, I'm not here to make friends, I'm here to make money, and there's no way I'm making any more money on fossil fuels. I thought that was an absolute watershed moment in terms of financial engagement with climate change. Wow. Wow. What you said, Tom, about the consistency there, I mean, isn't it brilliant that Allianz actually stopped insuring coal mines uh, because their asset management division said that it would be, in, you know, it would be inconsistent with the way they're investing their money. I, I just thought that that consistency was brilliant. That's what's missing from those governments with those sovereign wealth funds, uh, Tom, yes, that you mentioned. Exactly. And, uh, you know, a great honour for me in my career was way back in 2003, uh, at the launch of uh, the organisation CDP uh, in New York, Madeleine Albright spoke, uh, the, the former US Secretary of State, and she said, our business is to help investors vote with their money. And I always remember that uh, that very insightful way of thinking about this new uh, uh, this new force, you know, as politics, you know, some national governments seem to be increasingly stuck and yet investors are emerging as a very powerful force into the vacuum uh, with so much potential. Cool. So, I mean, this is, a, and part of the pleasure of this podcast is we get to have these amazing conversations with this wide range of guests, you know, and I think having Oliver today was a different type of guest to who we've had in the last few episodes, but just absolutely fascinating. Um, so, uh, Christiana, you are, will be away for the next couple of episodes. You are leading an expedition yeah. to Antarctica with National Geographic. So Paul and I are home alone. Yikes. Well, I'm sorry, guys, um, but honestly, what 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 a total privilege to go to Antarctica again. I was there last year, um, and I have the incredible privilege of going to that absolutely unique uh, and quickly melting, hence very painful, continent. Um, yeah, for the next thirteen or fourteen days. Thirteen days. So you'll tell us about it when you come back. Well, have a wonderful trip, Christiana. We'll do our best in your absence. Yeah, you behave, guys. You behave. (laughs) We'll try. (laughs) Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. So there you have it. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism and is produced by Clay Carnot. We love hearing your feedback. You can send us a message at podcast at globaloptimism.com. And hey, you can slide into our DMs on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter too, if you're on those. I'd like to thank Callum Grieve, Freya Newman, Pete Cluttenbrock, Chloe Revel, Marina Mancilla, Zoe Trelock antich Nigel Topping, and Michael Northrup. I know we ask every week, but it does make a difference if you leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. If you like the podcast, go there, give us a five-star rating, leave us a little review. It really helps get the word out about the podcast and helps us grow so we can keep bringing you an episode each week. Okay, that was great. We will see you back here next week. Bye.